Asia virtual workshop on containing the silent pandemic. Um, first of all, I want to thank my colleagues who have put this together. Uh, my colleague Amit Kurana, who heads our work. Colleagues uh, Rajeshwari, uh, Deepak, and Divya. They have put together what is, I think, going to be an extraordinarily important meeting. Um, we have Renuji and Sorry, I think I disappeared for a minute. I will go back. Uh, that's the voice we want you to hear and we want us all to hear is the Asian and the African perspective. Because when it comes to AMR, we need to understand what are our priorities and what is our pathway ahead. I know I have very distinguished guests with me, with us for the inaugural session, whose time is very tight. So I'm going to cut all the formalities and jump right in. I just want to welcome the three very important speakers that we have uh, for the keynote in the morning, the inaugural address. We have Dr. Vinod Paul. Uh, for many of you in uh, the world, uh, you may have, uh, you must know of Dr. Paul. Dr. Paul, in fact, is leading India's entire effort against COVID-19. He's in the Niti Ayo, which is India's premier in, uh, planning body, but also its executing body. But Dr. Paul is someone who is deeply entrenched in the issues of society, of medicine, of access to medicine, to large numbers of people, particularly children. I don't think we could have anybody better than him in the position that he holds today to help the country steer away ahead. We have Dr. Renu Swaroop. Dr. Swaroop is the Secretary of the Department of Biotechnology at the Ministry of Science and Technology. And I know that Dr. Swaroop has a very deep interest in the issue of AMR. I have been talking to her and I have been amazed to see not only, I mean, the Ministry of Bio, the Department of Biotechnology often would not have, I think, taken this leadership without her active role in it. And so we are very, very privileged to have you, Renuji, with us to talk about this and to explain to everyone what indeed the Indian government is doing and thinking about the pathway ahead. And I have Dr. We have Dr. Uh, Offrin. Dr. Offrin is the WHO representative uh, to India. Uh, welcome, Dr. Offrin. Particularly happy that you're here as well because we want WHO is playing such a key role in this across the world. And for this region, for our region, we need to make sure that our voice and our priorities are understood in the world. So without much ado, I'm going to actually start my presentation and then I will ask uh, speaker the inaugural address to be given. So this meeting is about the One Health approach to fight AMR. And we are calling it containing the silent pandemic. And we say this because at some level, what we have today is a current crisis, but we also have a new crisis and a silent pandemic. I mean, we are living in unprecedented times. I mean, literally, as I keep saying, this is the revenge of nature when an RNA, not even a DNA, has brought the world economies to a complete halt. In all this disruption, we must focus on another pandemic, not so obvious today, but one that threatens our health systems in a way that we cannot even imagine. This silent pandemic is as catastrophic as COVID-19 or, or the other catastrophe that we are all very aware of, which is climate change. I keep saying, just imagine the scale of human tragedy if the medicine we take stop working, if the disease cannot be treated because of antimicrobial resistance, that's what we are looking at. But I also want to say that this is a unique time in the world when a lot of what we believe in is on the agenda, on the global agenda. Health is on the global agenda. The pandemic 
of COVID-19 has made sure that every politician, every leader, every institution today knows how important health is. But also equally, the issue of equitable and universal access to vaccines is on the global agenda. We are realizing the independence of the world between the rich and the poor. We are realizing that unless everybody has access to the vaccines, nobody will be protected. And most importantly, we are realizing the cost of inaction in public health. So this is a time when health and the need to invest in health is something that is top on everybody's mind. But secondly, we recognize the role of prevention. I mean, when COVID-19 began, one of the biggest issues that was, is, is talked about is the role of clean water in preventing the infection uh, from spreading. That's preventive health. And the government of India has done something really important in this last budget. It has included access to clean water and sanitation as part of the health sector spending. I believe this is a game changer because it changes the way we look at water. We, it changes the way also as we must look at health. And I believe today with this change in the definition and in the uh, way that water has been included, now the measurement of progress, the health sector will have to focus on preventive health as well. That's important when we move ahead. But thirdly, we also know that COVID-19 and AMR is a result of our dystopian relationship with nature. It is about the way we are growing our food, managing our environment. So all three issues, I believe, are understood today more than a year ago. This is our opportunity to really upscale our discussion on AMR. So why should CSC be involved with AMR? I mean, we are not per se involved in health issues. We are an environmental group. But the reason we are involved is because our work teaches us that we cannot first pollute and then clean up. We cannot follow the rich country approach to first chemicalize and toxify our environment and then invest in cleaning up. It's completely unaffordable for us. Our governments have competing priorities from reaching healthcare to education to many other things that need to happen. Therefore, we have learned to list that we have to do things differently. We have to walk the paths that nobody has walked yet. We have to leapfrog and reinvent pathways for growth without pollution. Now, this is really about the pathways and pathways. I mean, one health approach is clearly critical. We know that there is more than one pathway for antibiotic resistance. And that's really how CSC gets um, involved with this discussion. Because even though that one critical pathway is the overuse of antibiotics by us human beings, we also know that we are now using increasing quantities of antibiotics to grow our food, from crops to livestock to fish farming. When CSE did its research on antibiotics in honey and then poultry, we found very high levels of antibiotics in these products, which we eat. And these were given as growth promoters. But we also know that antibiotics are given as for disease management. And it is also clear, just as the debate happened 20 years ago with pesticide, these the use of these is important for farmers to safeguard their animals. Then there is the other pathway that we know of, which is the problem of waste. You have contaminated with antimicrobials, farmer waste to poultry waste to sewage plants. So both the livestock and food group pathway, as well as the environment pathway are becoming as critical and this is really the work that we have done over these past some years, a very quick uh, review of this work. In 2010, we released our report on honey. In 2014, we looked at poultry industry and antibiotic waste. In 2016, we looked at fish. And then again, we went back to the poultry industry in terms of resistance. We've looked at crops and it's very dangerous to see the amount of antibiotics being used in crop management today. 
And then, of course, we've looked at the issue of food, of fast food, of uh, the dairy industry, once again, on the how the daily dose is happening. And we have also been working with countries, both in India states, as well as in different countries, to look at how would you actually build an, um, a national plan uh, for and how would you implement it? And this is really why we wanted this discussion. So what then is the way ahead? Our world, our emerging countries, and I'm speaking because we know India best, but Africa, Asia, we're all in it together. We have double, triple challenges. On one hand, we have to increase health access to our people. We need access to life-saving medicines. We cannot only talk about excess. We also need access. We also have to increase food productivity and ensure farmers get livelihood security. But at the same time, we cannot afford the high cost of cleaning up after contamination. If you look at pharma industry waste, one of the key critical pathways from um, environment um, where uh, antimicrobials enter the environment, we know that cleaning up that waste, surveillance is such a tough job. But once you have it, you will have to do surveillance. You will have to think of cleaning up. And lastly, we cannot afford the high cost of medical treatment when basic drugs will not work. Literally from our part of the world, just like diabetes, AMR is unaffordable for us. We cannot afford it. And so we are very cognizant of it. And I particularly am very happy to say this because I think it's important for the whole world to understand how aware and cognizant our governments are to the crisis and the challenge of AMR. So finally, and this is what we will discuss over the next two days, is that how do we reinvent the pathway? There are four tasks in front of us. One to ensure that critically important for human health antimicrobials are not used in livestock and food. This is absolutely crucial. We cannot afford to lose the power of these antimicrobials. So this I call the conservation agenda. We then have to ensure that we continue to increase food production without the use of antimicrobials. This is the development agenda. The third is to ensure that the waste from pharma and other sources is tracked and contained. This I would call is the environmental agenda. And fourthly, and most importantly, we need to seriously reinvent the way we do business with our food and environment. We have to talk about preventive agenda as being at the core of our battle against this silent pandemic. So that's really what we will be discussing over these next two days. And this was a quick overview just so that you got that sense of what we are going to do. And I will now call upon Dr. Rodrigo Offrin, who is the WHO representative to India. Welcome. And please, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Share the presentation. Yes, uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the in invitation, uh, Dr. Narayan, for uh, the Asia-Africa uh, Summit for AMR. Uh, Dr. Swaroop, Dr. Paul, uh, thank you. I was uh, such an honor to be always again with you on this topic in, in this panel. Uh, I'm just taking off from uh, the presentation of uh, Dr. Narayan, and I'm, I'm taking it a step further, not just reinventing, but reimagining the strategy to tackle AMR in India. Um, for for us uh, now that in this in this current COVID world, but not yet post COVID world, we are living in a world where um, health has been a focus, uh, as as was mentioned by Dr. Narayan, that this is uh, no other time in 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 history where health is such a priority for development, for economies, for for just main survival of, 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 the, of humanity. And so this is also an opportunity for us to reimagine how we will deal with other problems that are a threat to health security, such as AMR. Yes, 
So AMR needs One Health action. I think the, the time for all the uh, discussions around coordination approaches, the need for a One Health approach is finished. It is about a, a One Health action. Um, just listening to the presentation of Dr. Narayan to set the scene is that the um, issue of use of antimicrobials in, in the human ar ar health arena and animal health arena is, is a big one. The AMR bacteria is across, across sectors, whether it's food, environment, animal health, human health, and AMR residues are of course seen in, in, uh, in the environment and also in the food. 30% um, of our antimicrobials manufacturing are used by humans, but 70% are used in animals. So this is something that's uh, fairly difficult to even monitor. Um, and we'll go down to the other issues later. Up to 75% of antimicrobials used in aquaculture may be lost to the environment. 50% of municipal waste ends up in landfills and often dumps, including expired and unused antimicrobials. Up to 80% of consumed antimicrobials are excreted in urine and feces. So this leaches to the environment. Um, and the waste from pharma industry is another area. So we're, we're actually living in a toxic world and we are, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's feeding back to the whole problem. The, the, the point is that we have to really reinvent, reimagine or rethink how we will do things because the problem is just getting more and more complex. It's not, uh, it, it, we're not making a dent to it. That's uh, because it's so interlinked and uh, there are so many things to be done, but uh, let's move on to the next slide to see how we should proceed. So the National Action Plan for AMR for India is composed of these six uh, pillars, I would call it. And uh, just to color code and give you an, uh, a picture of what it entails. All sectors, uh, responsibilities of all the sectors are those boxes in white, okay. Uh, in human sector, it's in blue. Uh, and the food and animal health uh, is in yellow and environment is uh, green. So for the most part, every aspect should be an interaction and, uh, and, and collaboration and coordination of all sectors, whether it's communication, uh, training, education, surveillance, laboratories, infection prevention and control may have different terminologies and approaches. Uh, well, for, for a healthcare facility, it will be uh, infection prevention control. For animal health, it will be um, biosecurity. And for community and environment, it's an engagement of taking care of, 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 of the environment, as was the prevention agenda, concert, uh, the, the development agenda uh, that was being discussed. Optimizing use, again, all sectors. Innovations and R&D. This is where I think this forum is so important because it's a sharing of information. It's a sharing of ideas, of uh, possibilities of what's new. And of course, the last one, is also very important for this uh, forum, which is international collaborations, national collaborations, even subnational collaborations. So I will just posit possible strategic options. Although I'm speaking to um, the National Action Plan of India, it may very well be applicable to any country. Consolidation and communication uh, of communication and information resources. It's all in different silos. Why not consolidate that to a repository that many of uh, various sectors can use? Now with, with uh, COVID, we've seen that learning platforms, e-learning platforms, blended learning, there are so many uh, uh, available technologies for us to, uh, well, train whether it's, uh, people in the health sector, animal sector, environment, or maybe just a concerned citizen will be able to understand what are the basics of AMR and how it uh, uh, operates in various spheres. Uh, awareness campaigns, should we drop awareness campaigns and just give continuous information? 
So it's, it's reimagining a strategy as well of how we communicate to people. Unless there is a public demand that AMR should stop, it will, it, it will still remain to be a, a huge problem. If you see that uh, the John Andolan for, let's say, uh, COVID, if it captures the imagination of people and you are bringing them in to the fight, then uh, th that's when you know your awareness campaign has, has been a success. So that's probably what we need to do for AMR. Uh, knowledge and evidence, national standards for AMR, especially for surveillance, that's, that's key. Uh, it's SOPs, the th thresholds required, alignment of AMR repositories across ministries. They are, in, again, in different silos. How about a national AMR report or a dashboard where we can see if our actions are uh, moving around across all states or, or, or across sectors? Uh, on the third pillar, we, we can see the national IPC program. That's something that can be considered. Uh, thus far, what we have are uh, infection prevention control guidelines. But how do you really turn this into something which is an action uh, accredited, standardized across all types of healthcare facilities? Again, leveraging on other missions, the Swatch Bharat mission, uh, Ayushman Bharat for, for healthcare and the Kayakal program. So, uh, moving on, uh, optimizing use of antimicrobials. Uh, surveillance of antimicrobial consumption and use is just as important as surveillance for AMR. Um, if we're not able to track the use, uh, then, then, then we are moving very blindly or a bit late because then the, the uh, resistant uh, bacteria is, uh, it has already formed resistance. But, but by tracking use, you are a bit ahead of the game, at least. You will be seeing where it's, where it's irrational uh, use and procurement of such drugs. Implement treatment guidelines for antimicrobial use. And, and, and the, well, there are guidelines, but really, how, how do we monitor? How do we make sure that the, the guidelines and protocols are really followed to the letter? Uh, antimicrobial stewardship programs across all levels and all sectors uh, across different facilities. AMR in accreditation checklists, for example, before a hospital gets accredited, then there are a few things around AMR that need to be in place, whether it's a stewardship program or capacity building for its uh, or staff. Uh, on the fifth pillar, innovations and R&D. COVID has shown that India is a resource for response. It, is, uh, it may have its vulnerabilities in terms of uh, possibilities for uh, resistant bacteria, but it is a resource for response because it is a hub for knowledge and research and product development. Uh, I need not say what has happened through uh, the past year, uh, but just with vaccines alone, we can see that India can really make a difference for other countries, for the region, and for the world. So the One Health AMR research agenda is so important. So it, it's, it cannot be research agendas across different sectors, but what if it's across sectors looking at specific, a specific research agenda? Of course, um, the, India is the pharmacy of the world, and this, this, this year has proven that um, whether it's research, development of vaccines, uh, production of PPEs uh, across diagnostics, therapeutics, uh, and, and, uh, and vaccines, we can see that it can be made in India and it will be financially uh, sustainable. Sustainable funding for research is another area um, that may be you know, planned or invested in because without research, it cannot move to new solutions, whether they're new molecules uh, for, uh, or, or, or ways to uh, improve um, uh, early, how, how this early prevention and, and control of, of uh, AMR. Uh, collaborations, this forum is about all of us in the region across also Africa, South to South collaboration is very important because there is context. Uh, there might be certain guidelines or standards, but if they're out of context of a country, uh, then it will not be implemented. As I mentioned, you, you, 
each country will have to set, set up standards for its own AMR surveillance. Systematic information sharing amongst national programs, whether it's TB, malaria, HIV, AIDS, leprosy, they should be sharing information uh, around uh, what is resistant, uh, their, their, their resistance in these disease areas. State action plans, because health security, global health security begins from a subnational health security. And that is true with AMR a multi-sectoral uh, one health coordination at state level or subnational level and alignment of state implementation plans with the NHM. That's another, another area. So the idea is also to leverage all the investments that are already there within country and Uh, health budget is also looking at a One Health ins institution. So that's also something to, to look forward to yeah. and how to implement that. This is just a picture of all the stakeholders. Uh, there might be more, at least in the country. It, it, each country will have its own counterparts. And there's also the private sector, private sector in the healthcare sector, whether it's animal industry, agriculture, all need to be taken in and on board uh, for One Health action to happen. I think I'm on to my last slide. Yes, okay, the possibilities. I think every, um, well, every country may have to review, rethink its national action plan for AMR in a post-COVID world and what's possible. Achievements, uh, well, revised priorities. Who are the stakeholders that are not included? Uh, new timelines. A, how about uh, the idea of a possibility of a national authority for the containment of AMR rather than task forces, uh, strengthening drug regulation in non-human health se sectors? That's that's, uh, that's a common question for for many countries. Uh, maybe all of these are 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 really ways to um, uh, move from from uh, just approaches or specific plans per sector, but a coordinated implementation of a national action plan. Of course, One Health AMR uh, and do it in mission mode. I know the DBT under Dr. Swarup, you have a mission a AMR, uh, One Health AMR. Um, how do you budget AMR work plans, including staff? Uh, how do we strengthen labs in all sectors? And this is not a strange concept in India where there was from two to 2,000 uh, labs for RT-PCR within two and a half months to monitor AMR and AM residues. Can centers of excellence for AMR uh, containment uh, help? Can they be tasked with specific areas so that uh, you know the information and knowledge further drives the implementation of a plan? And lastly, it's really about coordination because as with my first slide, it's all spread in various sectors. Uh, it's finding innovative ways. Uh, so with that, and, and I, I wish good deliberations to this forum, but just put, it, put, put a reimagining, rethinking, reinventing lens in the discussion so that uh, we're, we're able to progress further in, in the fight against AMR. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Dr. And thank you for the invitation. I think very well put Dr. Ockren, and thank you so much for your uh, overview. Very important. Uh, messages. Um, Dr. Swaroop, can I now call upon you to give your inaugural address? Uh, Dr. Swaroop. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sunita Narayan, for this invitation. Uh, Dr. Paul, Dr. Rodrigo, all the panelists who are here. It's such a pleasure to be here for a very important topic. And when I discussed with Sunita, uh, the importance of it is actually what brought me here today to be with all of you. Uh, what I'm going to say, actually, it's been made so much easier by the presentations which uh, Sunita made and Dr. Rodrigo has brought out so very clearly what the major issue is. But I think there's one more thing which has made it very easy for us to discuss AMR today and what Sunita brought out in her presentation, the fact that all of us have gone through this pandemic. Uh, before this pandemic, we kept emphasizing on the importance of AMR and how important it is, how we should really drive it as a citizen's movement. We should have national action plans. We should have global collaborations. It worked. It worked on a pace of its own. But I think we saw all that actually getting translated into, you know, things hitting us with the pandemic. And very rightly said, 
the silent pandemic and that's the amr because what this covid has brought to us is a very clear reflection of what any such pandemic can do and how important your preparedness is to be able to tackle it and handle it <clears throat> in one way we all say that the pandemic came to us suddenly obviously we were totally unprepared yes we were but the fact that we had a foundation of research science technology addressing different aspects probably helped us to bring together that ecosystem very quickly to be able to respond to this pandemic and uh, dr paul will of course give you because he's led this whole covid from the front and brought in all the various components but i think the way we saw the scientific community responding to it is something which has given us confidence that even amr we can move with the same speed with the same level of collaboration what really is the challenge for the amr and i think uh, it was there very clearly in the presentation which sunita brought out in fact it's very good that today on the international water day sunita you're having this amr conference which brings in the amr perspective of the importance to water because when we talk about amr many a times there is a tendency to only think of human health <clears throat> and now to a great extent to think about animal health because you look at zoonotics nobody goes beyond that to think of environment to think of water to think about the food the soil I mean, those are all so equally important when you look at this whole one health approach because unless you address those priorities you will not be able to address the key aspect as to how do the impact a human and various other uh, components of it so we we flagged it as an important area internationally there has been there's been a recognition of this being a priority but yet we see that there is not sufficient research there is not sufficient innovation happening on it the way we would have expected it to happen in all these years and why is that so because this clearly as i said becomes a human health driven activity so far so everyone is looking at it to see what is it in terms of how would it impact the pharma industry where is the market for that antibiotics that we are developing how is it that we are going to take that forward and also importantly the research that we do it's scientifically and also procedurally very complex so what is that ecosystem that we are building to facilitate this research to move on if you just track the pipeline of how this innovative research has been going on for many years and i'll come specifically to what we are doing in india but globally as well you'll see that it's not just india globally it's a very weak pipeline that we have right now many industries many groups got into doing research on to it but then probably it was just left either at the research level and not taken forward for various reasons the key reason is of course it has to be a pull and push factor that takes anything forward and in this case i think both of them were not aligned in the manner that they should and i think it's that alignment of the pull and push factor which is so important for the amr research also or the amr sector and research since i represent the research group and my ministry is responsible for it i obviously come in from that angle so you'll see very very few uh, even leads that we can push forward if you look at antibiotic research very few even in, which have reached the clinical trial stage now the fact is if we look at today how we responded to covid the expectations of the global community of the stakeholders of the citizens we have sort of raised their levels of expectation so much if everyone will now ask us a very clear question if we can have a covid vaccine in less than one year why is it just taken us years and years and years to have a vaccine for tb or for any other of these such major priorities that we are talking about if we have treatments that we have been able to develop for covid why is it that for these amr related infections we do not have the same type of treatments that we've been able to bring in diagnostics so quickly within india we ramped up our diagnostic ability for uh, covid and in less than 
90 days, in fact, 60 days to be precise, we had indigenous COVID diagnostics which were there, which fulfilled our needs. Do we, can we say that for all our other infectious diseases? Why not? We are talking about RT-PCR, we are talking all multiplex PCRs, a technology that we are all so conversant with, a technology that our scientists and researchers have their full control on today. Why can we not just put AMR as our priority now and take it ahead? So I don't think we even need to wait for COVID to be over. Post-pandemic will come, but I think parallelly our efforts on this, taking our learnings from COVID need to move forward. I think the other aspect is, and it's, it's today important that we obviously keep referring to what COVID taught us because that's a huge learning. But if you go back to what our emphasis on AMR has been, and uh, I'm glad that Rodrigo brought out those slides and gave you the national AMR work of the government of India. So it's not that we're talking about AMR today. We've been talking about AMR for last many years, and India has put in a lot of priority to that. If you see, it was in fact uh, way back in 2009, when India actually became a member of the um, South Asia One Health Initiative. We then, of course, started from 2010 when the task force on AMR began this whole discussion. We started our policy in 2011. We had various declarations, whether it was the JEPO declaration in 2011 or the national program on AMR in 2012. But finally, when we had our AMR national policy that was brought out with these six key verticals, which Rodrigo brought out so very clearly, I think that brought in the focus. Why, yes, I do see his last slide, had all the ministries put in, had, had all the stakeholders and government put in. To a great extent, this national action plan did bring in a synergy. But I do admit that we do need to take that further as we've done for COVID and bring in those synergy levels much, much greater. But we have all aspects of it and coming specifically to what the Department of Biotechnology has done in our mission AMR, working very closely with all agencies, ICMR, Health Ministry, uh, the Indian Council of Agricultural Research, the Department of Animal Husbandry, Ministry of Environment and Forest. But what we brought in as a newer perspective is because the Department of Biotechnology uh, through its uh, public sector, BIRAC runs a very major, vibrant public-private partnership program. So it gave us the opportunity to bring in the, the private sector and more importantly, to also engage with the startups. Because we, we must remember that this has to be a stakeholder-driven consortium that we move forward with. And I think that is really what has given us the strength to take it ahead. So right from research and innovation that we support for therapeutics, and I did see in the chat box uh, the comments about our uh, phytopharma and other such groups, I must say that that is one of our priority areas. We have a whole task force on phytopharma, mm -hmm. and they are looking at uh, issues related to AMR, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, diagnostics, of course, we've done a whole landscaping of which are the diagnostics which are available, what stages are there so that we can help move them forward. But I think we took one very major initiative, two rather, two major initiatives. And one is that we work with WHO and very recently, just in the first week of March in our Global Bio India, our Honorable Minister, who's the Minister of Health as well, Dr. Hashwardhan, released the India priority pathogen list, which we have worked with the WHO country office. So I think that's a very important beginning. We have our priority list of pathogens that we need to take forward. We've also notified in 2018 our biorepository for AMR, 2019 to be precise. Now that is a notified repository for AMR, which is at the National Center for Cell Sciences. It's a biorepository which is already identified as an international repository authority under the Budapest Treaty. It's recognized by Ministry of Environment under their biodiversity. And today we have in fact a number of surveillance groups who have already notified that for their deposits to be made in there. Whether it's the state reference laboratories from Maharashtra, whether it's the medical uh, reference groups through the armed forces, medical colleges, or the food and safety, FSSAI, the NCDC, which is most important, has also notified that, and their pathogens are also moving to this. So that's a huge resource 
which very many people and that being an international depository is a resource which is not just for the country. We will be able to share this as a resource through global consortia that we work in. Uh, India has also become a partner to the global AMR hub and the Department of Biotechnology represents the government of India in the AMR hub. Now in the AMR hub, we are now setting up the national, the international dashboard. And that is obviously mandating every government to set up a national dashboard for research and innovation. Our work has already begun and we'll work with all partners. Maybe Sunita, this could be an excellent initiative for the Asia Africa group to now put together such an initiative to have that dashboard as we move forward. So as I said, we are working with organizations nationally, internationally. We have the Longitude Prize that we work with UKRI, our partnership with UK for a number of such AMR initiatives that we've taken. Also the last box that you saw of international collaborations, we've been seriously working on it. Huge number of initiatives. Paucity of time, I cannot go into more details of that, but I think that is our strength. If we've been able to do it there, this group can clearly use that as an example for us to build upon it and take it forward. Absolutely. Lastly, I would like to mention that we have one case study for AMR that we're taking ahead and mm -hmm. that's our work on TB. Mm -hmm. And in TB, we have set up with the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program, what we call the Regional Prospective Observational Research for Tuberculosis Report. And we have seven sites that we have created around the country. And these sites already have cohorts which are existing. They've already contributed to the clinical trial work which is being done for the TB vaccine. And that again could be a wonderful example, first of all, just to build on our TB search. And this TB uh, report consortium, I know working with WHO, it's actually gone to other parts of the Southeast Asian region as well. That could be, again, a wonderful report. We have a biodepository with 150,000 samples already collected and deposited. We have a centralized data management system that is there. So I'll conclude, uh, uh, Sunita, by saying our research at different levels is on, whether it's for vaccines, whether you talk about vaccines for infectious diseases. But I think what we need now is the pace of acceleration which COVID has taught us. In COVID, my own department has been uh, leading for a great number of activities, but what we have taken forward in a big way is not just isolated research. We created a research consortium. More than 500 researchers came together. We deliver diagnostics. We're delivering right now vaccines and therapeutics. But more importantly, we've created an ecosystem which goes beyond COVID, whether it's our clinical trial sites, whether it's our immunoassay labs, whether it's the animal challenge facilities. And this is clearly a reflection of having a common goal, a common objective for us to move forward. So what maybe your group could look at is we've got one health centers, we've got this whole ecosystem existing. Can we now just accelerate this progress in different countries? Absolutely. Can we now collaborate so that we have a huge collaboration and more importantly, bring in a sustainable action plan, which we all collectively own. I think it's that collective ownership and responsibility which will help us to take it forward. So thank you so much, Sunita, for having me here and sharing my thoughts with you. Thank you so much. Brilliantly put, and I think just shows the scale of action. But as you said, the pace of change now needs to move, and that's what we will hope. But I cannot think of anybody else who would be able to understand both scale and pace as much as Dr. Vinod Paul. I mean, he's at the thick of it and he is managing both the scale, but also the pace. And so Dr. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, the chair is, the, the speech is yours for your address. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good, good morning. Thank you Sunita ji for the opportunity. Uh, Sunita ji, Dr. Rodrigo, my distinguished colleague, Dr. Enu Sarup, and friends from both India, Asia, as well as Africa. It's a privilege to talk about uh, an issue which I, I very strongly and passionately feel is critically important for our well being and one health in a way. Uh, I, I think you heard the perspective, public health perspective, the civil society perspective. Let me bring the clinical 
clinical dimension to this because I have felt that for, for decades, this whole area uh, from the perspective of newborn health. I, I am a neonatologist and I was always amazed why newborn babies get so many more antibiotics than they need and in doses that they don't deserve. Uh, I, I'm bringing this little story to just say that dimension is a very critical dimension. The behavior of the clinicians and the providers and the wider community that should be engaged is those of uh, doctors, uh, nurses, and other providers. Uh, I was leading a consortium of about 30 top institutions, uh, neonatal care institutions. And when we would leave, look at the data, the incidence of sepsis in front of me, 2.5%. This is 150,000 newborn babies in a particular year. But the antibiotic usage would be five times this. And if you liberally use antibiotics like this, you will lose them. And I saw over a period of time how we lo lost sensitive to, to gentamicin, then, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, class after class uh, lost uh, uh, utility of those antibiotics. And then we are chasing a mirage. We also led up uh, my institution and I steered a Dennis collaboration at, as it was called more recently, about seven, eight years ago. And we published that work in the Lancet and to draw attention to this whole huge disturbing area of antimicrobial resistance in newborn health. So that these are my, my specific credentials and why I come mm. really passionately mm. uh, join your hands you know, as, a, as a passionate champion for this cause. But you know, for India, we know that we will bear the brunt of AMR more than other countries, much more than other countries. We are in a, in a likelihood of uh, you know, losing 10% of our GDP when the world will lose 7%. We will lose disproportionate. We will, we will suffer disproportionate, disproportionately to the rest of the world because our population is large and our, we are in a development and demographic uh, dividend situation that we are in, we will suffer more than others. And uh, some estimates say that AMR would be the commonest cause of mortality by the year 2020, 2020, 2050, by the year 2050. We don't want to be landing up in that position. But today, the situation is very disturbing. We top the total antibiotic consumption in the world. Well, per capita, it may be low, but then there is hell of a lot of antibiotic floating around in hospitals among humans and beyond human, as you highlighted, Dr. Rodrigo. Our carbapenem sales are the highest, among the very highest. You know. and these are frontline antibiotics. We're losing them. And then you heard how much antibiotic usage is occurring in agriculture and, uh, and uh, in animals. We don't even know the true extent of this. I hope, uh, Rodrigo Ji, we can have a second slide or third slide of your, which shows the use of antibiotics for India, for the world perhaps, should be, we'll try to generate that for India. And I'm sure there'll be very revealing information. Our antibiotic consumption in animals uh, compared to some other countries is lower, but it is it is rising and to rise further. So these, these, are, these are very disturbing portents. You heard that we have aligned around a national action plan and Renuji has highlighted very, very specific areas where we have made progress. But we also have to make progress as to how the, the, the provider community handles antibiotics. And I like to highlight five action points which apply to Africa, which apply to my institution, my country, every state, every district hospital, every clinic. And these are the following. I just want to highlight because I know you'll be discussing them at detail. Clinicians should avoid the urge to prescribe antibiotic. That's the first action. We must avoid, for every small reason, antibiotic prescription urge must be curbed. We must treat infection and not a situation. A simple cough is not antimicrobial requiring situation all the time. We must do diagnosis if we, if we can and as much as we can, whether it is microbiology or a rapid diagnostic test. Fourthly, 
we must target the pathogen and not the menu of pathogen and we need to be sensible about it we should follow the the sops we should have the confidence to follow the to follow the sops follow the right algorithms in our approach to using antibiotics and we must have the urge to stop antibiotic as soon as we think it's not infection we don't we carry on and on and on these are the five actions at least five actions for people like us who other than the animal breeders and agriculturists are the, are responsible for this menace there are three wisdoms that i like to take forward on a broader scale mm-hmm. one we must have universal antimicrobial stewardship program in all facilities in all healthcare settings why are we not doing it this part of action is waiting to be done in my own small way in my institution we started antimicrobial stewardship program is reasonable success mm. i know it takes time i know why actually it is not being done conversely because it needs people coming together agreeing to the rules agreeing to the rules agreeing to to hierarchy of decision making so in my institution for the entire department i not just my unit i said this two antibiotics only i will prescribe nephrologist will not prescribe i know nothing of nephrology but you know it had to be elevated to a decision point where there is accountability so first wisdom is promote antimicrobial stewardship program in all clinical settings in the next 5 years can we do it that's one second we must have a major thrust toward prevention of infection yes. we have learned during this pandemic the rules of preventing infection some of the rules some of the rules are common mm. and this is about hand hygiene this is about asepsis protocols in the in the clinical settings and so on and this is about uh you know early diagnosis in the right diagnosis so that i don't get tempted to use the antibiotic to to presumably save the baby or the patient and therefore preventive approach is very critical and i think the 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 prevention aspect has come center stage with with covid and of course look forward to vaccine why can't there be a vaccination for acinetobacter i want to understand from you know you know these bizarre bacteria i'm sure there must be some way to have vaccines against them so prevention and the third one is indeed what you have highlighted sunita and we heard so eloquently from rodrigo is the one health approach amr is true something that demands a one health approach and i think there are gaps because it is multi sectoral it is sectoral it is 360 degree complex but it has to be done it's about it's about us it's about planet it's also about animal health by the way it's about human health so i do agree that all roots of antimicrobial resistance need attention and resources be it human health food animal production and waste management and environment to effectively contain contain the emergence and spread of amr from all sources in all parts of the of the world i also endorse the principle that you highlighted conservation and i like strongly to endorse a balancing of excess and excess truly because we actually need to be using so much more antibiotic usage in the community to avert pneumonia and its related mortality of children which is unacceptable which is avoidable mortality antibiotics must be used more often india children need more antibiotics in that sense i gave you a story of overuse in a new born setting in hospital setting but overall india children and i guess adults are deprived of optimum antimicrobial excess in a way that's why we have such a high mortality so i love the notion of balancing excess and excess development agenda environment agenda and prevention agenda you you really crystallize it very well i like to add my endorsement and my support to the national action plan for amr that was uh, discussed 
uh, by Rodrigo and highlighted by Renuji. I think we should be together uh, in, in, in this fight, Asia and Africa and the world. We need to go to the state governments and provincial levels in my country and in other countries. And I extend your full support of Niti Aayog for the, the work that is assigned to Niti Aayog by the government to take this, take this initiative, take these initiatives and take this mission forward. And I assure you that things for which Niti is good, which is generally intersectoral coordination and convergence and synergy, mm. you will find a friend in this, this building here. So let's try to avert the time travel into pre-antibiotic era and we are together. In Thank you very much, Jai Hind. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Thank you so much. Just, I want to really emphasize, I think the point you've made right now is the critical one. When my colleagues have been working at the state level and the country level to implement the national action plan with them. And what they're finding in the One Health approach is a lack of coordination between the environment, the human health, and the animal health sectors. And I think that's really where your role in Niti will be so crucial. And thank you so much for both your passion and your commitment to this. I mean, I know that you are somebody who has, who has this in him. So we are really privileged that we had you. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. And we have this three-day meeting happening. We will come back to you if it's okay with you at the conclusion of this meeting with the key findings. And so that we can then engage with you in terms of what we learned in these three days and how we would be grateful if Neeti could take now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I will now turn to Sujit to help us to understand the civil society perspective in all this. Sujit, please. And let me just introduce you, Sujit, so that everybody knows. Uh, Sujit Chandi is the professor, Department of Pharmacology and Clinical Pharmacology at the Christian Medical College in India, and, and somebody working in this area for a long time. Sujit, please. Thank you very much, Sunitha, and thank you for the privilege uh, and to the CSC team for inviting me to talk very briefly about the civil society role which we can play um, in the uh, whole issue of um, AMR. Um, I was trying to get a definition for civil society and uh, the WHO actually in its social determinants chapter defines civil society as a space for collective action around shared interests, purposes and values. The inclusion of civil society voices is essential to give expression to the marginalized and those who have often not heard, who are often not heard. And I think this is very true when we look at AMR. AMR, antimicrobial resistance, antibiotic resistance is complex. Uh, as we've just been told, it's one health. There are multiple factors involved, not just in the cause, but in the effect. And there has been a lot of effort in the recent uh, decade, but fatigue often sets in. There are implementation challenges. Financial support is a huge problem and therefore sustainability. And therefore I truly believe that civil society uh, has a huge role to play. Why do I believe this? Well, I have a few points in front of me. I know there's going to be a separate session on this, so I will try and be brief and just elucidate some of the major points. One is I think we as civil society can be a supportive role in its true sense for governments. This is not just for the national action plans, but for health education as a whole, for community outreach, even just a repository of information like our React toolbox. And most importantly, I think a voice which the governments need to hear, both from a supportive point of view and a governance point. So I think we need to fulfill this role because governments by themselves will not be able to tackle um, this hugely complex issue if you really need to move forward. The second role I foresee is an accountability role. We as civil society need to play a keen, have a keen eye and a constructive voice for governments and international agencies. And why do I say this? Because there are critical gaps which are 
often the problem in many areas of health issues, both in planning and implementation. And especially in low and middle income countries, we tend to struggle with many areas all at one time. And therefore, to be able to identify these critical gaps and give that voice and observation to the governments and international agencies is so important. The third role I would say is the advocacy role. And we all know how difficult it has been uh, in the movement of rational medicines use, rational antibiotic use, not just because there is misuse, but it is also access issues. And that creates a unique uh, complexity uh, whenever we look at how to contain uh, or do have appropriate antibiotic use. We need to advocate both for financial support for action and plans. And we all know in each country, the difficulties we've all had in trying to ensure that there's enough financial support. We know that for most of our people in low and middle income countries, affordability and quality of healthcare are huge issues, um, not just from um, overall healthcare, but especially medicines, out of pocket expenditure. We also know that regulations and guidelines are often flouted. And this therefore means that we need to be able to show, be sure that the guidelines or the regulations that we are put forth in front of the public are actually implement, uh, you can implement it as well as it's practical. And finally, it needs to be effective in order to be able to really bring the, forward the AMR movement. But it's not just about the government, but we need to remember that we need to be a, a bridging role, have a, have a bridging role where we can help to integrate a top-down and bottoms-up approach. And therefore, we really need to be in touch, not just with the government, but with the public, the community, and all stakeholders. And because it's One Health, we really need to touch base with the farmers. We need to touch base with those in agriculture, with environmentalists, and also those working in the healthcare field. And not, the, not very many people can do that, but the civil society will have to make sure that that becomes one of our prominent and necessary roles. And with that in mind, we have a very important role, I feel, in a networking and convening manner, because there are going to be various groups in the AMR field, which probably have never talked to each other. Though, of course, efforts are always being done by governments on this area. But we in civil society have our roots and have our connections with those on the ground. And we need to bring those voices forward if really we need to network. So it's not just the One Health sectors, but various civil society groups often have various themes and priorities. But we should realize that in all this, we need to look at where at once I had a meeting with around 100 NGOs and uh, they all said, when I talked about AMR, why hasn't anyone talked about AMR to us before? We didn't realize that this is critical. Yeah. So that kind of a convening and networking role is so important, not just within civil society groups, but students, women's groups, One Health sectors. And we need to encourage dialogue between the government, the industry, the academia, and other stakeholders. Not many people are going to do it, but as civil society, I think that is going to be a defining role. Thank you, Suji. Thank and you. Let me just end by the last two points. The narrative role, I think, is going to be the most important for the public. We need to provide an emotional connect to get the public interested. Storytelling, translation, and highlighting best practices among the professionals is going to be crucial. And that needs to translate to action on the ground, community mobilization in all One Health sectors, facilitating behavioral change and implementation of plans on the ground. And that therefore means that if you really need to do this with the public, our mainstreaming role in health, healthcare, hygiene, and One Health. So ultimately, we need to help the developmental role, both from a universal health coverage, poverty reduction, food justice, and environmental sustainability. So in summary, I think civil society is a key to bridge the critical gaps, involve the community, build the movement, and ensure sustainability for NAPS, 
and the overall AMR movement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sujit. Very well put, very well put. Amit, can I now call upon you to uh, wrap this session up, but also take us seamlessly to the next session, which will now begin in the next, uh, at 2.45. Amit? Yeah. So thank you very much, Sunita ji, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I, I think I would not even attempt wrapping this session up. The kind of discussions we have had, the kind of perspective and insights we just heard, in the last one hour would not only benefit, hugely benefit the three-day discussions, but also as all of us go back to our workstations after the three days, it, I think it will, it will inform all our work for the next many, many months and years. So, so on, on, on that point, in, in that light, I can just say a big, big heartfelt thank you to all the speakers, Dr. Dr. Saroop, Dr. Orphan, uh, Dr. Paul, Dr. Chandi, and Sunita Ji, yourself. I think uh, we couldn't really have had a good start uh, other than this. So, so with that, once again, a uh, big thanks to all speakers. I would also like to thank all the friends, colleagues, AMR champions from, from the African and Asian countries and of course other parts of the world and our colleagues in India who have joined us today in this meeting and also are uh, uh, listening, uh, watching this live. So uh, thank you very much. I just want to tell you one thing. The issue of AMR needs you. It cannot be fought without you. So, so that is very, very important for all of us to understand. Uh, as many of you would know uh, through our program, uh, very, very important aspects are to be discussed in the next three days. We would be talking about national action plan, how it is to be implemented, how it should be implemented. We would be talking about the, the issue of political commitment, the issue of funding, uh, the expectations from the national authorities and the national government from the global governance. We would also most importantly be talking about uh, the food and the environmental pathways as we just briefly talked about in the morning. So, so that, is, that is very, very critical. The next session, of course, is on the National Action Plan. But before we move on to the next session, just very important that we, we, we look forward to hearing from all of you. We have about 25 experts from 25 countries. We have experts, uh, over 100, 125 experts are from there. And what is very critical, what would make this discussion and three-day deliberation a success if we get to hear from as much as you as many of you as possible. So uh, th with that, I would convey my best wishes for a very fruitful discussion and setting the future agenda uh, of this AMR workshop. Uh, I once again, thank all speakers uh, and listeners and uh, we'll be back at 225. Uh, uh, we just have a five, 245, sorry. Uh, Actually, we just have a you're almost there now, Amit. So just a quick bio break is all people get. Yeah. Because 2.45, uh, the next session yeah. begins. And you have the chair as uh, Anuj uh, is the chair of that session, right, Amit? Yes, yes. Anuj Sharma. Good. And that's a session on effective implementation of national AMR action plans. So people, just a very quick bio break and you're back at work. I mean, when it comes to CSC and my colleagues, they don't believe in doing these things gently. It's all very, very packed. So please stay with us. Please, please continue to stay with us. Amit, sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, so I, what we can just do is uh, maybe switch off uh, 